test. Yeah. All right. Looks good. good. Yeah. Should I do it? Go for it. I'll do it. Oh, God. <clears throat> Cause you had a bad day. You take it one day. You turn into a bug <laughs> just to turn it around. <laughs> no way, dude. That, no way. That was so good. I'm afraid of getting a copyright strike. Plastic pills podcast pill pod 94. This is fiction, neither philosophy nor critical theory, but Ooh, what 94, can you do? Eh? We're almost getting close to the big three dig. There might be some crit theory that lurks its way in here. We'll see. Specifically, the text by Kafka. This is, this is the text that all of us force our students to read when they fail to turn in an assignment and they blame it on mental health issues. Right, guys? I think we just like to torture students with this because it's uh, relatively short and disturbing. It's a very it's a very effective policy. No, I'm kidding, because that would be cruel and po probably illegal, actually. But I found this reading again immensely enjoyable, um, even humorous, at the same time as being incredibly bleak. So trigger warning, content warning, Epilepsy warning, in case you need one of those. And of course, spoiler warning. Because we are going to spoil the end of the book. Uh, not a book, short story? Short story, yeah. So written in 19, uh, before 1920-ish. But you've had your chance to finish it, is what I'm saying. So, listener, here's your chance to pause it, because the ending spoiler comes in five, four, three. And not just the ending to Metamorphosis, but also to the trial, the hunger artist, the penal colony. The protagonist dies at the end and everyone else is happier for it. Is that what happens in everything? They all die and then people are better off? At least those four. Those are, those are the four endings I recall. Am I missing any? There are no happy endings for Kafka usually, but uh, yeah, this one, we are talking, of course, about the metamorphosis. This one is an infamously bleak uh, take on things, yeah. Yeah, so we, we were just banging around ideas about where to go with this, and uh, I read a Nabokov quote that said, or quotation, excuse me, we are with an English uh, PhD, ABD here, so I should get my quote versus quotation Correct. Once kills. There won't be a second time. Yeah. <laughs> Nabokov quotation saying that Kafka is the greatest writer, uh, German writer of our time. Such poets as Rilke or novelists like Thomas Mann, Mann are dwarfs or plaster saints in comparison to him. And as he kind of inter he introduced himself already, but with us today, it's Eric and I. And no Libvik today because he's traveling, but filling in is Litvik, not to be confused, but currently ABD, PhD in English literature. So if you're a regular listener, you probably know him from past episodes. And Vic, do you remember when you were last on, what episode it was? Yeah, I think we did the Purloined Letter from Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, right, the right, one right. before that was Edgar. Bartleby, which is actually, this Bartleby. one's a good follow-up to that because we're kind of back in that territory of kind of... Uh, you know, people having a bad day in the bureaucratic state. Let's put it that way. That is very true. He does complain a lot about his job in a very different way than uh, than old Bartleby does. But we're finally executing our literary follow-up to those episodes. And Kafka himself, I believe, worked in insurance. So maybe all the whining books, whining through literature is, is permitted here. Yeah. Yeah. Samsa is a traveling salesman. Gregor Samsa. And uh, Kafka's got some good uh, words, some technical words to describe the bureaucratic structure of his job. So it implies some kind of insight, unless this is just stuff people from the early 20th century would know about. But I have a feeling he's got some insight into this kind of garbage job work. Yeah, just before we get into this story specifically, uh, Victor, you're teaching this, as you mentioned, or you have taught it, right? Yeah, it's 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 been on the syllabus once or twice, yeah. Okay, so I wanted to ask you, because I've read Kafka several times, several classes throughout all the years, and 
the words that come up are like dread and the crushing bureaucracy and claustrophobia in terms of either the style or the content uh, variously. But the thing that I hear almost all the time, and I want to I want to get rid of it because I think if it's said all the time, there's something sloganized and perhaps misleading about it. But Kafka expresses the alienation of modernity, which sounds a little vague. I don't like the term modernity so much. So I'd wondered if you could just uh, respond or react to that 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 phrasing and maybe enrich it a little bit for us. Sure. I mean, it does start with some truth. I mean, Kafka was writing in the early decades of the 20th century in Central Europe. And this was kind of where we get the the early beginnings of what kind of becomes like recognizably, again, like the bureaucratic administrative state that has only become more relatable over time. So when we're talking about things like the nine to five office job, you know, this this sense of the, the bureaucratic state, um, we do start to see this developing more and more in the larger cities of Europe in the early 20th century. And that's why, like, it's easy to kind of think of things as, as of, of Kafka, perhaps, as kind of articulating these anxieties from that time. But if, for this story specifically, yeah, I, I think we have to kind of definitely go a little bit beyond that and not just look at Gregor Samsa's famous transformation into a giant insect, spoiler alert, as some sort of metaphor for capitalism or for the sort of bureaucratic state, which it certainly is on one level, perhaps, but also to take this transformation at face value and actually kind of perhaps think about it literally a little bit and consider like, if we take Kafka at his word, like what are we to make here of this individual who wakes up one day and is completely disembodied from his form? He has to sort of be reborn into the world in a certain sense. And the relationship that he now has with his family, which is completely altered, and all of the interesting interpretive possibilities that that opens up. So leaving aside for a minute, perhaps, you know, Gregor's relation to like his work or anything like that, or the questions of alienation there. There's a lot of other interesting directions you can take this story because what makes it so ripe and so kind of like continually relevant is that it doesn't really, it's very minimal in terms of the commentary. Like Kafka does not give us a simple answer here for like, what's going on? What are we to make of this really strange, bewildering story? Like we have to kind of finish it ourselves. We have to interpret it ourselves. So. It's one of those stories, it's 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 very modern in that sense, that like there's no easy kind of like moral attached to it. We have to kind of like make it relevant for our own time. And that's one of the really fun things about this story, I think, is that like it it, it is surprisingly versatile that way. Like there are so many ways we can kind of unpack like what happens here and beyond just the typical starting point of, you know, kind of like questions of Marxist alienation or perhaps even abjection. There, there's there's a lot of critical stuff that can be kind of thrown at this story, but even that kind of is just a starting point, I think, for uh, unpacking uh, Kafka's world here, yeah. So it's a good uh, way to describe it, uh, alienation, modernity, well, if you wanna sound smart at a dinner party, but we gotta go beyond it. And, and it, Kafka's writing is, is so significant that he also has a, an entire uh, adjective after yes. him named after him, right? Kafka-esque, Kafka-esque yeah. right? N- nightmarish complexity, bizarre, illogical, like uh, the trappings of bureaucracy being crushed under the weight of a kind of being really low down on the ladder of a giant bureaucracy where you can't really see the top and you just feel like you're subject to arbitrary and illogical kinds of forces it's one of those terms that i think like everyone is loosely familiar with but which can actually be quite hard to define yeah so the the kafka-esque is basically like like you said eric like this dealing with this like nightmarish bureaucratic world where which what's interesting we we start with a very grounded realistic kind of like world but then things quickly spiral out of control and we then start to just kind of have this like weird sluggish illogical sense of things where nothing is really accomplished and the character is just kind of like lost in a maze. So it's quite relatable even in the, in the modern world in that sense, yeah, even in our time. That's certainly true. Although in this text, at least the bureaucracy is mentioned, but it's kind of external and it's kind of at a distance. Whereas the only, you know, the only Kafka novel that is 
properly Kafkaesque is the trial, I'd think, no? Yeah, that's where I could see the alienation description being really relevant because it's also very impersonal. There's no, there's, there seems to be no face on the bureaucracy. It's just this sort of structure, this thing, we're kind of caught in the middle of it, we can't see the top, and it just feels arbitrary. And But emphasis also on just bizarre and nightmarish too. It's just, it's just wild. You have to just kind of accept, you know, the first line transformed into an enormous bug, for instance, here. It's just something you just have to accept and deal with throughout. And it's a little bit painful in a, in a way to read through it. But yeah, when we're describing something as Kafka-esque, it's just very strange, weird, frightening. It's interesting that you bring up all those words because I thought this was humorous. And same with the trial. Like all these things are rea- are happening to him. The reactions are very funny. But before we get to pulling the pieces of this apart a little bit, I thought I'd just give a summary in case anyone's here doing their, their English lit homework. Because <laughs> the plot you can summarize in a few sentences. The dude, I'll just read the first sentence because it's really significant, very often quoted. Um, one morning. When Gregor Samsa woke from troubled dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a horrible vermin. And some some translations say buck, I guess. He laid on his armor-like back, and if he lifted his head a little, he could see his brown belly, slightly domed and divided by arches into stiff sections. The bedding was hardly able to cover it and seemed ready to slide off at any moment. His many legs pitifully thin compared to the size of the rest of him, waved about helplessly as he looked. And then the entire plot takes place in one apartment um, in the family unit, but the family unit, as you guys were kind of alluding to, it keeps getting disrupted by people from the outside. People from his job come in, um, renters come in, the, the cleaning lady comes in, and they all have a different sort of interaction with Gregor, the now insect and the type of or not insect i should say bug or vermin it's not even said what kind of bug he is i mean pills's reaction is interesting i mean i'm not i'm not sure well i guess the, because it's not a clear you know allegory metaphor we want to stay away from that sort of thing i guess it really does depend on your sense of humor and if you're at home in kinds of categories of of pessimism and nihilism and those sorts then <laughs> then this is really you're locked in your house during covid yeah oh yeah i mean that's perfect that really captures the kind of cloistered nature of this whole thing right it feels very much like you could go back and read some gothic literature like like what's that one the monk or even something old like castle of otranto and it's very cloistered it's very interiority but in the interiority of rooms and houses, and you just feel very hemmed in. And if you respond to that sort of thing in a humorous way, that's that's your interpretation in a certain way. I'm not sure if, if Kafka's necessarily going there with it, but I mean, one of his uh, the the executor of his state, um, I for, I forget his name, but he described a conversation. Uh, Max Brod is the executor of his state, and he describes a conversation going uh, with Kafka, um, where Kafka says, "We are nihilistic thoughts, suicidal thoughts that come into God's head." <laughs> oh, Kafka says, "Our world is only a bad mood of God, a bad day of His." So actually, that opening uh, that opening riff isn't such a bad description. Actually, it's a yeah, God had a bad day, and then he thought of us. Well, if I can elaborate on why I find this funny a little bit, because I, I think it'll give give way to some meaning, is the absurdity of it. Because he wakes up, he says, what's happened to me? And immediately his next thought is, how am I going to get dressed and get to work when I have bug legs? Like, how am I going to make the train on time? I can't be sick today. So there's no question of, oh, what is this? What's happened to me? It's immediately, I'm a bug, but how am I going to get to work? No, and that that's definitely where the comic tone comes from because like Gregor isn't really even bothered by his transformation at first. Yeah, it's more the fact that he's going to be late for work, that he has trouble getting out of bed. 
And things escalate in a pretty funny way because then he's worried, well, what if my boss comes looking for me at home? I'm already five minutes late. And then sure enough, you know, you hear the boss knocking at his bedroom door. Somehow he's already there. The boss is arguing with his parents. So it really escalates in this like nightmarish way. But there's definitely kind of like a comic takeaway that you could have from all of this. Like Gregor seems to be more than anything else worried about losing his job. So the whole transformation into a bug thing is is almost like secondary to his uh, his financial obligations at that point. And the very, I know we, well, okay, we should explain why we're going to not do an allegorical reading. But as soon as I read this part, I'm like, oh, it's about depression. He doesn't want to go to work, but has to, has to get out of bed. And then his family is increasingly tired of him, like sitting around in his room. I was like, okay, this is about depression. But reading um, both Nabokov and Deleuze and Guattari, who I think are quoting Nabokov without saying his name, there's, they say, you cannot read this as an allegory. It's not a metaphor. And since we have our purse expert and what a metaphor is as a sign and all that here, I wanted to ask you, Eric, what you thought about reading this as a metaphor or an allegory or something that means like a one-to-one comparison, a sign and a signifier? Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't fix a meaning to it, right? Like it's not a, it's breaking conventions, whereas in purse symbols are conventional meanings. On the other hand, metaphors are more allegorical, right? They they set up a likeness between two things. Like an allegory is an extended metaphor, for example, right? It's an extended metaphor which you describe in detail and everything involved in it is meant to, you know, mean something else to provide some kind of comparison, you know, for the literary folk, right? A comparison without using like or as. But what is a, a metaphor for depression? Okay, maybe. Is it a metaphor for like the weight of capitalism, right? This is the early days of capitalism. You got to think there's World War I ramping up, going into it in the background of this as well. There's There's all kinds of, you know, you know, Marx had written about the Jewish question, and that question was still very much alive at this time, even before World War II. Um, and in a sense, you can't pin it down to any of those meanings because this is so domestic in a certain way. There's no, there's no, there's no proof in the text. There's no evidence in the text you could really draw upon to nail it down as a metaphor for this or that thing, in a comparative sense. It doesn't form. I mean, Peirce would call it a likeness. What is this like? It's, it kind of is what it is in a certain way, and we have to do the work. Yeah, and just to add on to that, what's what's really fascinating here is that you don't even have to look for a metaphor because the metaphor has already become literal, right? It's not that Gregor is like a bug or that he is bug-like. He literally is a bug. So that in itself kind of like slaps you in the face and like presents you with the physical, like literal nature of this transformation, right? So in the way, and especially in the fact that Kafka doesn't actually describe him in detail, but he just kind of leaves it a little bit ambiguous, but clearly there's been a physical transformation. He already is kind of steering us maybe towards looking at this in in more grounded terms, which is kind of what makes this, again, so weird and unsettling even to read, because there, there's this weight, there's this physicality to this world that Kafka is describing, even though it has like all the appearance of a nightmare you really feel like you're there with Gregor kind of like figuring things out for the, for the, for the first time in this new state. Yeah. And met- metaphors tend to take you somewhere else, especially allegories, especially religious allegories. They tend to point somewhere else. They point to some transcendent other place. Right. But you know, Kafka's favorite line, Oh, there's plenty of hope. There's an infinite amount of hope, but not for us. Right. We're that, we're that, those bad thoughts in the head of God, right? We can't escape. So metaphor is no escape for us. (laughs) Allegory is no escape. There's no transcendence (laughs) within this imminence. (laughs) It's just, we just have this, this shit show that Kafka describes for us. So, I mean, that's, that's also coming from your reading of Nabokov, right? He's saying this, this is not the closest thing we get to a metaphor in this whole story is probably the apple which we'll get to a bit later. But everything else really just is a head scratcher 
it's it's really weird and we should we we should also point out as well that so nabokov was like no notoriously kind of adamant about people not allegorizing his own work and he was especially kind of like uh critical of freud and psychoanalysis so uh, we we can't completely say that nabokov speaks for kafka here because we don't know the extent to which kafka himself might have wanted to like bring up certain associations or implications with this kind of magical transformation that gregor goes through but yeah so I think Nabokov is certainly onto something here insofar as he's kind of like urging us to take this story at face value first and foremost, and then we can kind of dress it up a little bit further and kind of, you know, bring in other readings or traditions in play. Yeah. All right. So the, the setup, we know a little bit about Gregor's backstory, and we find out that in a sense, before the story started, like yesterday, presumably, he was... a uh, he was in a human body, now he's in a bug body. But even the day before he turns into this bug and he's worried about getting to work, we find out he's kind of trapped in his family structure by his job because his dad is bankrupt and he's sort of the breadwinner for the family, it sounds like. So he has to go to work because his dad is unable to work. Um, and that's why he's a little bit frantic immediately about, you know, getting to his job. He has to get the right train. And the first plot point that happens, they're all trying to get him out of bed. He can't get out of bed because he's got six legs. They're all trying to get him out of bed, but they haven't seen him yet. And even not having seen him, his, his, uh, they call it a clerk, which I guess is like something like an office manager. Uh, there's some time period stuff in there. Maybe you guys know about, but his clerk comes to his house because he has missed the train. It's right there. Imagine you're like manager or your boss just like coming to your house. That's that's already pretty scary. That's already a kind of yeah. invasion. I don't know if they'd regard it the same way at this time, but that is very much, you know, you can't. You're trapped in this house, and yet your boss is there with your family, like being like, "Hey, oh my god!" And some of the shit he says to Gregor too is just insane. I would quit my job, but obviously he can't. There's a lot of reasons why he cannot. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited to get into it. I don't want to run too far ahead with that though. And he seems to be very worried about the hierarchy at work. Where if he if he doesn't arrive on time, he's gonna get written up by the office. Like he, we get it, we get a look into the hierarchy of his work, where there's a whole bunch of terms that I have no familiarity with. But it's like the head clerk, the office assistant. But you can kind of imagine that this pr probably cra uh, graphs really well into a modern office. With here we got the HR, we got the supervisor, we got the boss and uh, all that kind of weird structure that is never fully explained. Maybe the time period, like a, a contemporary reader would get these terms a little more. I, was, I don't know what they all mean, though. And it's, it's, it's worth noting, too, that Gregor seems to have had some sort of military background. So I don't know how much that kind of influenced how he sees his workplace, but it, it does seem to be very regimented, very hier hierarchical. Like, he is that kind of cog in the machine. But What's also interesting about his family status or his home life is like, even though it seems like he's just living at home with his parents, it's like, actually, they're living with him. Like he bought this apartment. He's kind of like subsidizing their incomes. And that's why they depend on him so much to kind of get to work and everything. So it's interesting in that sense, because they they don't seem to be very supportive or sympathetic once he kind of runs into these physical difficulties. Like, they just seem to kind of view this as a financial problem for them at that point. It's like, oh no, our our son can't work, therefore he is now a, a problem. Like there's very it's it seems very transactional at that point. And the bankrupt father goes back to work after he turns into a bug. Yeah. So presumably there's no reason that he couldn't be working. They're just living off him. And then as soon as he turns into a bug, then they got to go back to work. The sister but becomes the uniform... a sales girl. Yeah, they all have to kind of like make do without him in a way. And they manage, but they seem very annoyed that they have to work yeah. without Gregor. And it's interesting that you bring up the uniform because the uniform comes up a few times. Everyone who comes in, or not everyone, uh, some of the people that come into the house, they're wearing uniforms. His father sleeps in his uniform. There's a picture of Gregor on the wall with his military uniform. So you, I, I think that's not a, a reach to understand what Kafka's trying to do there 
describing first of all these work hierarchies, these and then these uh other forms of hierarchy or symbols. Yeah, one, symbols one thing that is actually funny is that at first he tries to rationalize this extremely absurd situation where he's transformed into a giant bug saying, my God, what a strenuous job I've chosen. It's like work stress has turned him in. Like he's just rationalizing it. He's like, oh man, maybe if I just go back to sleep. He's, he's, he's thinking about how hard his job is. Like, oh, I have to travel all the time. And I don't, I'm not able to have like relationships that go beyond like perfunctory formal courtesy. Uh, he's he's just rationalizing it, and you're just reading it, thinking like, how is he actually thinking of this? Is an explanation for his situation, but it it also <laughs> makes sense because he's just kind of ignoring it because he's he's got this one track mind. He's like, got to support the family, got to support the family. But father had a business, collapsed about five years ago. He's got a little bit saved up, but not a whole lot. So they're just completely living off of his paychecks. And he says, I'm happy to give it to them. I'm happy to do this, but it's very stressful. Maybe that's why I'm I'm a giant bug. Yeah. And he really seems to have like no sense of self beyond his job. Like his hobby is like studying train timetables. He'd like <laughs> yeah. it's Pretty much his whole life, but it's 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 interesting because you you mentioned Eric, like yeah, he 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 can form relationships with people, and that's almost like even even his job as a traveling salesman kind of like touches on that, right? Like he's always on the move. He doesn't really have like a fixed state outside of his work. So yeah, there there there's there's a lot that goes into kind of you know this 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 sense of him being just identified with his job. The point where like he has no relationship with his family even outside of you know. Gregor Samsa yeah, traveling it's a, salesman. It's a completely yeah. grotesque and inexplicable reversal of dependency because suddenly he depends on them to slide food under the table. He he depends on the sort of sympathy of his sister to figure out what foods he likes now and figure out how he wants his room arranged. Like, does does he want the furniture up against the wall or should the furniture be pulled away from the wall? And he's kind of listening in on what they're saying, but he completely depends on them now, even though for presumably about five years, they've been completely dependent on him. And then it's just an inexplicable reversal of that. And it, it generates a little bit of sympathy for Gregor right off the bat for that, I think. But then you understand it's like, but how can you live with this bug in the house? Yes, this sounds a. It sounds a little bit like it could be autobiographical. I don't know because I didn't want to psychologize the reading because I think those are off, often the most superficial readings. But the 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 structure, I guess you could call it the Oedipal structure, just being penetrated all the time by these bureaucratic structures from outside. We get a real sense of there's no boundary of the house from external bureau. Bu Oh, excuse me, bureaucracy and internal bureaucracy. And I just wanted to read a, a quotation that illustrates this. So his he misses his train and his boss or chief clerk, whatever that is, comes in to his house and he says, Mr. Samsa, what is wrong? You barricade yourself in your room. Give us no more than yes or no for an answer. You are causing serious and un unnecessary concern to your parents, and you fail, and I mention this just by the way, you fail to carry out your business duties in a way that is quite unheard of. I am speaking here on behalf of your parents and of your employer, and really must request a clear and immediate explanation. I am astonished, quite astonished. I thought I knew you as a calm and sensible person, and now you suddenly seem to be showing off with per peculiar whims. So he gets turned into a bug and his boss comes to his house to guilt him on behalf of his parents, whom he is supporting. Yeah, pretty presumptuous on the part of his, what I just call it a manager or something, head manager comes to the house. I'm speaking on behalf of the boss and your family. Oh, okay. Pretty presumptuous there. And then no sense of gratitude, which I think is something we can all, you know, identify with you know you've been giving your life to this company 
running yourself into the ground. And then as soon as you do one thing wrong, it's like suddenly the guy implies that he's stealing. You know, oh, maybe it's that the boss gave you these uh, cash checks the other day and now suddenly you're not coming to work. Hmm. It's like, whoa, dude, back the fuck off, man. Like, is there no gratitude for the life that has been given to you? No, that's just how it works in Kafka's world. <laughs> and I have no idea what the job situation, what like what a tr- chief clerk is, and I've already said this, but this cannot be normal, even in Prague in the early 1900s. So there's definitely something going on here uh, referencing this inner penetration of your work life and home life and how it's bleeding into the same thing. Yeah, we 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 know that Kafka himself didn't have like a great relationship with his father. And he actually referred to like the family unit in some of his letters as like an organism. So he he might be drawing a little bit from his own experience here in terms of some of the anxieties or re- resentments even. But even without getting all like autobiographical on it, yeah, like there there there's this enormous like tension and anxiety that clearly is all kind of like building up here where everyone is outside his door everyone expects something of him and it's like in a way gregor is just like starting from scratch here he's figuring out his own body he's just like almost been reborn in a certain way he has he's really incapable of delivering what they need from him and what's interesting is the the quote that you mentioned pills where um the manager is outside his door berating him that's before they've actually seen him in his new form because that's when like things really take a turn for the grotesque as as eric mentioned like we we it's it's hard to like understate how like disgusting gregor is in this story you know like he can't actually talk to them he's hissing all the time he leaves this like slimy trail wherever he tries to move around He's crawling up the walls later on. So like, (laughs) even as readers, we're kind of like, I I don't know, it's a little bit disgusting to be like in the same room as this character for that long. Like, it's really off-putting in a certain way. So that's something else to consider here. He stinks, right? His sister has to like open the window and breathe at the window every now and then because it presumably just smells like crap in there. And this grotesqueness of his body now his his legs that seem to sort of have a mind of their own at first i don't know if this is a mark of kafka's style but these really minute descriptions like he really drags you through the details and immediately after that part you know he his boss is outside his manager i should say is outside and he does try to open the door and kafka's sort of details he offers to that are amazing the way he props himself up the way he sort of slides along the wall and then he puts his mouth on the key and this sort of really heartrending part where he's like oh what they should <laughs> yeah. be saying is go on gregor you can do it get the door open they have no idea what he's going through on the other side of that door and he describes his mouth being on the key and this like brown liquid, then he's like hurting himself doing this, chomping down on this key, cutting his mouth, and this brown liquid is pouring out of his mouth as he's trying to open this door. He's trying to explain himself at the same time, and presumably he just sounds like, <laughs> and then his manager turns to the family. Yeah. Goes, did you get a fucking word of that? What did he just say? He's offering this very rational explanation, and it's all just so obscene. It's it makes you it makes your skin crawl a little bit just reading those those scenes especially Ugh. yeah it, it's it's almost like in some ways kafka's like daring us as readers to be like disgusted in the way that the family is it's like all right what how much further can i go before you like feel that feel what the parents are feeling basically cuz that i i think yeah that's actually where a lot of the narrative tension here comes from because like there's a lot of sympathy that we would want to have towards gregor but like He is a man-sized insect, you know, like at at a a fundamental level, like it is off-putting here. The character is associated with something which is just like gross. So right away, we we ourselves have to work to have any sense of like human empathy for this individual. Yeah, which is such a contrast with what you might read at this time too. I can't imagine, you know, reading this versus reading, you know, what would you be reading at this time? Like The Great Gatsby by Fitzgerald or The Sun Also Rises, which are are very sort of prim and proper and polished and elegant. And they don't take you into this grotesque world of 
disgusting juices and slimes and buggy legs and these <laughs> extremes of like oh so sad for gregor but he's so disgusting at the same time how am i supposed to feel yeah just 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 to mention the closest precedent for that would be something like probably dostoevsky's underground man like you know somebody who's clearly like isolated and like aloof but like not disgusting to this level yeah like but someone clearly undergoing some sort of like existentialist trial yeah or in terms of the bureaucracy mechanisms that you're trapped in, the one we read, Bartleby, uh, around yeah, this absolutely. same period, yeah. except there's no, like, that's a, a, a description from outside. And what I was thinking, this this is, the short story takes, what, two hours, maybe three hours to read. Just the the plot you could summarize in three paragraphs and finish it easily. The plot doesn't really matter so much as what Eric was talking about, these minute and intense descriptions, not only of the world and like how he's trying to get his pants on, how he's trying to open the door, but also his feelings, his feelings of of like, I don't, I guess he doesn't really feel revolted by himself. He kind of understands why his family is treating him this way, but his expectations from his family, but compared to their responses to him, he looks around hoping to see this, but instead he sees them doing this. And he doesn't really identify. I mean, he he kind of shows some understanding of why they would be treating a man-sized insect like this, but he doesn't really that's not part of his shock, I guess you could say. Not no. a, none of his shock comes from being a bug. It comes from the way they treat him for being a bug. Gregor is actually quite curious about his new situation. Like he's kind of exploring his legs, checking things out. And it's it's more so like his family who are like completely disgusted by what he has become. Like there, yeah, there it does kind of pose the question of like, you know, if his family was was able to accommodate him in a certain way, would 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 this necessarily be a tragedy? Because yeah, like spoiler alert again. The story ends in Gregor's gradual death because, like, he's abused by his family. They don't know how to take care of him properly, and eventually, he just like feebly crawls off and dies. So, that's it's the family's actually relieved at that point, and it 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 kind of again suggests that maybe if they had just sort of uh, interpreted the situation differently, Gregor didn't have to be like cast out in this way because Gregor, as a bug, is not like terrified of himself it's more so that everyone else around him doesn't know what to do with him anymore at that point how do you read that if you want to well wager? Would, he doesn't fit into conventional social frameworks anymore right like physically and socially there's something about him which can no longer be classified and that's where like it this opens up in so many interesting interpretive ways because like is is gregor like disabled in a certain sense is there something queer about him is there some, like beyond just the sort of marxist financial implications here there's there's clearly ways in which like the family fail as caregivers towards gregor's new state right except maybe the sister because the sister does seem to at least try to like you know bring him rotten vegetables and stuff and kind of like try to see gregor as a bug but Everyone else is just like not having it. Which, by the way, she's not abusing him. He he only wants to eat rotten vegetables. No, no, no. She brings him milk, which he's like, yeah, what the fuck is this? I want like, drink. <laughs> but she she, arra she arranges the room for him so he can crawl more freely. So well, actually, the ultimate betrayal is her because she's like, we would be better off if we just forgot that he was our brother and let him die. Whereas she's the only one who shows any amount of. Uh, empathy for him at the at the first couple days or the first we don't know how long the story goes on exactly but at the beginning she is the only one who still sees him as gregor or tries to and the real tragedy is eventually yeah, even in a she way right up. she kind of drops this reasonable thought saying you know if if he really was my brother if he really was our our gregor he wouldn't put us through this for so long Right. And Gregor's getting a little bit pissed as the story goes on because they're sort of losing their, you know, they're losing their will to do what they're doing. You know, she figures out he likes old cheese. So she comes in and looks at what he does and doesn't eat, tries to bring him more of the stuff he does eat. and But eventually it just becomes too much of a burden. And for him, it's like, well, yeah, he supported them for so long. But then on the other hand, you know, Kafka holds out this kind of very perverse hope. He, he, 
tortures you with this hope that maybe he'll change back. Maybe, maybe it's just a cold, but you eventually realize he's not going back to the way he was. It's not a phase, mom. This is who I am. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 really hard to kind of tell how comically we should be taking it. But there, there's a deep tragedy, of course, by the end where like they just they refuse to accept that this is their son or their brother anymore. It's like we just want to move on. And like Gregor is gone to us, even as like Gregor, the bug, like meekly is like looking around the corner and hissing at them. So depending on the different literary approaches you want to take here, it opens itself up to every reading because you were normal, you were part of the family unit, even the base of the family unit, then something about you changes and now you are, we, we kind of try to accommodate you for a little while, but eventually you just become a complete annoyance and everyone wishes you would go back to the way you were or just die. So I know our listeners, you could... Put in whatever, fill in the blank into whatever, you know, relatable analogy you have. He doesn't give any clues as to what that analogy is, except maybe the Apple thing, which maybe we should bring up. But yeah, it's a story of someone who fit, no longer fits. Yeah, and spatially, leave he's or die. in the middle. But in another sense, he's now on the outside. He's outside the family circle. But spatially, he's in a room in the middle of the house. There's doors and rooms abutting on his room on either side and he kind of is flitting around inside this little cave that becomes real nasty and smelly and it's a it's a very cloistered gothic feeling where he's stuck in there and he becomes this sort of it becomes almost like um it's that 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 russian film the um uh where the, the guy leads them into that sort of um dead zone that that no go zone where yeah, the stalker. stalker. Yeah, like his room almost becomes that that area, that zone where you go in and everything's just sort of not the way things should be. Everything's uncanny and a little bit strange. But yeah, it's pretty much a, they want to just like condemn his bedroom and just like forget that he's there. They actually have like uh, these uh, renters who come in towards the end. And they're actually quite pleased with some of the apartment they're interested. In. And then they see Gregor and they're like, no, 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 we we change our mind. We don't want to live here anymore. And the family's like, God damn it, Gregor, just fuck off. We're trying to sell the house. Yeah. So it's <laughs> it, it just becomes yeah. again, it it's constantly a financial problem for in them. In a perverse sense, his his transformation brings life back to his father too, right? Because his father starts to be assertive. He's assertive with those those renters. He's also much more assertive towards towards Gregor. He pokes him with the broom. He 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 kind of corrals him around with the weapons, and then he eventually bombards him with apples when they have this confrontation and this weird little dance. Is he can't turn very well, so he kind of charges at him, and the father sidesteps, and then he slow Gregor slowly turns and then charges at him, and they have this weird little dance, and then the father just ends up sort of putting apples in his pockets because now he's like dressing up and going out and he has this regular these regular clothes on now before he's just kind of sitting around in bathrobes and sleeping at the table and and having breakfast for like four hours a day and then his father's kind of life comes back to his father again and you get this sense oh my god was this like the family became dependent on him to the point where they were becoming slovenly and they were not thriving even though in Gregor's mind, like it was all him carrying them along, servicing their debts, making sure that nobody comes collecting. And then in the end, you know, actually his removal kind of breathed new life into them. They all got jobs. They all came into their own. And really, you could look at this as almost like a coming of age story for his sister as well. By the end of the story, she blooms, like literally she turns into a young woman she stretches out like the story ends on that note with her, not with Gregor's death, but with the family finally all leaving the house and the sister, you know, stretching and they realize she's a young woman now. And so there's that hope. But then as soon as the hope emerges, the story ends. Yeah. <laughs> He's replaced. He's successfully. replaced. So, yeah, there's a happy ending, at least for his sister. Yeah. In that sense. 
So there's two uh, little artifacts in this story, and maybe more if you think of them, but two that I was puzzled by and I wanted to ask you guys about. Uh, the two are the apple and the picture of the woman. And why don't we start with the apple? Because I think that'll probably take a little bit longer. Yeah, I set that up a little bit, but that's the thing I said. Maybe that's the metaphor, oh, but what could it be the metaphor of? You know, you have the the apple, supposedly, that was eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I don't know if there's no textual evidence to support that interpretation. A kind of forbidden fruit. So, well, pl in the plot, what happens, I should explain this. In the plot, what happens, he's trying to get back to his or he's trying to turn around to go back to his room because he find out, finds out he's not wanted. And his dad starts throwing apples at him. And if you imagine, he's probably got some sort of carapace or like armor on his back. And the apple gets stuck in the armor and it, and starts like sitting there and rotting. And I think it eventually, it, it causes him pain for a long time and might be part of why he died. But anyway, the apple, an yeah, apple Nobody's kills willing him. to go in and take it out. Because they write, they they make no effort to establish communication with them. There's very minimal communication going on there. Even though Gregor is all there, he's all he's 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 rational, he's thinking. But there's this just wall between him and his family, literally and metaphorically. There's a wall between them. Yeah. So there's a few things to note there around that because that symbol does sort of jump out, especially in a story which is this spar sparse about like kind yes. of like yes. furniture and things like that. Yeah. So one thing to note is, first of all, Gregor's family is actually seen to be Christians. They're Catholics, right? Like they cross themselves a few times. So even though Kafka himself is from a Jewish family, there, there's clearly kind of like a religious dimension here, which we probably shouldn't ignore. And the connection of the apple with original sin, of course, as, as you noted, Eric, is, is the most obvious one that comes up. But then the question comes back to like, why did this happen to Gregor in the first place, right? Like, is he being punished for something? Like, normally, at least in like traditional classical sorts of metamorphosis, when somebody gets turned into an animal or an, an, an ob, like a plant, whatever, it's because they've done something, you know, they've, they've displeased the gods or they have sinned in a certain way and they are now being punished for that, right? And that tradition would definitely have been like, would not have been far from the minds of Kafka's readers and even Kafka himself. So on one level, we are perhaps being invited to think about like, wh why is Gregor suffering here? You know, what has he done? And is there a reason why, you know, his father is pelting apples at him with all of the kind of Oedipal and Judeo-Christian implications that that has, right? And mm -hmm. What we're really left with is like it's no aside from like being a provider for his family we don't really know anything else about this guy like it's not clear why he has been punished if indeed this is a punishment right and so i don't know we we kind of seem to just be left with this almost nihilistic sense of like there's there isn't this sense of justice in this universe at least where you know, this man is being punished for a reason. It's just bad things are happening to good people and it's not clear why, right? And if, if that's a commentary on the modern world more broadly, or if it's like a religious statement, like that's for us to decide, but it, it, it does raise some interesting theological implications, I think, yeah. The fact that in, you know, in say Ovid's Metamorphoses, right? That's it, that's it. When you're a, a mortal and you, you spy a god, say, you know, there's a story where someone comes up and sees a god getting changed and they're naked in the woods. And then, you know, you get turned into something as punishment. You metamorphosize into some non-human creature as punishment. And at least to the reader of that, it's clear, you know, it's a little bit arbitrary, you know, in that the gods, they don't punish you for just reasons. They simply punish you for transgressing. But here there's boundaries everywhere. And it's not sure, it's not clear which boundary, which transgression you've crossed, you've committed, that's incurred this punishment. And so what what has he done? You know, God is completely sort of left unmentioned except for those those little hints at it you pointed towards. So has he done something wrong? Is it because this this good thing he thinks he's been doing for his family has actually been holding them back? He claims that he's been staying in this job and they've been holding him back. But in a sense, his care for them has been holding them back. And so 
there is that the sort of arbitrary whimsical punishment that he's suffering it's it's not clear right and the and the apple maybe suggests that sort of thing a kind of a kind of throwback to a a, a, a weird paganistic kind of transgressive attitude that is completely out of place in because God is supposed to punish you for moral transgressions, right? Because he's morally perfect. <laughs> the old gods are not morally perfect. They're not exemplars to be followed. It's There's a lot there, and it's, yeah, it is. Those are interesting questions to ask. I was just wondering before we get to the portrait, is it significant that the father delivers this punishment after? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, after, after he's been such a good son, he's been like, taking care of the family, he's been doing his duty. The second he stops doing his duty because he got turned into a bug, then he gets punished by the father and is, this is not Oedipal, I swear to God, I was thinking biblically. Uh, it is, it's very it, It's very biblical. I don't think it's an accident at, at all that the father figure here is pelting apples at the sun. I mean, it's, it's dripping with symbolism because aside from like the actual sort of biblical tradition, there's also actually like Jewish folk tales and fairy tales in many cases where magical transformation of this sort takes place or like even jokes or something like that, which Kafka would definitely have been familiar with. And he's kind of like coming from that background. So the idea of like an individual being turned into an animal or something, and then potentially being turned back or not, like there's usually, there's usually a, a divine presence behind this, right? Like there's a reason this has happened, but that's what's so kind of like frustrating, but also interesting here is like, there is no reason given, right? It's just like the cycle is not resolved because normally like even in Jewish tradition, okay, you have someone like transgressing or sinning, they cross the boundary, they get punished, but then there's a way back after the exile, right? Like, okay, there's a chance for redemption. And here, Gregor just, he, he crawls off and dies. There is no completion to this cycle. So that is interesting, but troubling in that sense, because we're definitely invited to at least think of this in terms of like the father casting apples and the son doesn't have the chance to really like make up for whatever he's done wrong. If he has even like committed any offense. Really. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. They're Catholics. The son has done nothing wrong. The father kills the son, uh -oh. and the whole family is redeemed at the end. He's a martyr. Yeah, maybe. They, they get to go into paradise, which is the beach for them. No, and the, the ending is really worth noting, again, where like the family's so relieved that Gregor is finally dead, and they take this walk, and as you noted, Eric, yeah, they're, they're, they're looking at their daughter, and they notice, like, wow, she's really growing into a beautiful young woman. It's almost like she's had her own metamorphosis in that way, as, as, as you noted, and she's the one who is now kind of going to be taking the family forward so yeah in, in one way or another gregor just needed to get out of the way from their perspective but it's it's not a very happy ending for him yeah okay so if we're done with that i don't know if it's a christiology or just an absurdist dies for no reason this this one is even more puzzling though the second thing that I, and I, like you said victor because everything's so sparsely described this really sticks out so in his room there is a uh i'll just read it there hung a picture that he had recently cut out of an illustrated magazine and housed a nice gilded frame first part it showed a lady fitted with a fur hat and a fur boa who sat upright, raising a heavy fur muff that covered the whole uh, lower arm towards the viewer. Very descript. She's wearing fur hat, fur thing around her neck. I don't know if boa means anything. It's written in German, so I assume not. Otherwise, we'd have a snake and an apple, which should set off all of our alarms. But anyway, I don't think that's probably the case. She's got a, thing, a fur thing around her neck, fur thing on her hat, and a fur thing on her arm. So she's covered with fur. Any yeah. any thoughts on that? And he can't he can't let it go. Like he keeps this no. is his one object of comfort, I guess you could say. This this is his most valued possession. Yeah, and his sister notably tries to move this portrait when they're like you know insect proofing Gregor's bedroom, and he's like he hisses. <laughs> no, he he wants to hang on to this portrait. So yeah, this could be seen as like whatever. Like it's it's the last remnant of his humanity, or maybe even like his sexuality, because. I think what, what's being described here is actually like it's technically like a, a Venus in furs. 
it's a kind of image of like this woman who's kind of like scantily clad. And again, it's, it's not like quite, it's not pornographic, but it's erotic. And it, it actually, there, there might be an intertextual link here to um, this, the actual story of Venus and Furs from 1870, which is, which was written by, um, I think, uh, this author in Vienna about uh, this character who goes out after dark and he has all kinds of interesting, you know, sexual encounters and everything like that. And in that story, the, the hero notably assumes the name of Gregor as an alias at, at one point. So Kafka is probably doing a little in, intertextual shout out there as well. But even aside from that, even aside from like the implications or the connections of like, you know, this interesting, almost like repressed sexuality after dark in a European city, there is this link clearly like this, this image symbolizes an element of Gregor's humanity or sexuality that like he does not want to lose and his family doesn't understand this. They want to move the portrait, but he he is just really not yeah. unhappy about that. It's also interesting to note that it was in a gilded frame before he transformed. Yeah, yeah. It it is it does represent you know his previous existence before the transformation, and as he's going along, right, he's he's listening to what his family is talking about. And mainly, like, his sister comes up with this suggestion, right? Oh, we should, like, take all the furniture out of his room, right? And so they're coming in. He says, you know, they were emptying out his room, taking away everything he was fond of. And in a way, he was he was okay with it because he just discovered, to his delight, that he could, you know, run around and crawl up the walls and crawl up the ceilings. And his sister was noticing this as she was cleaning the room and said, hey, maybe we should just, like, make more room for him. And then, but then he hears his mother speaking and his mother wants to keep everything the way it is, right? His mother's saying, no, we have to keep the room just the way it is in case he comes back. And he hears this and he's like, oh, wait, she's right. Like, if they get rid of all this stuff, I'm going to completely lose my hand humanity and descend into complete bestiality and so no i need this so he's like tries to crawl out and puts himself on the frame and he says he said it says he crawled up in haste and pressed against the glass which held him fast and felt good on his hot belly and he sits there to try and keep it at least one thing this one thing in the room they've taken his dresser out these two frail little women are carrying all this heavy furniture out. He's not concerned about that. He's concerned about now himself and his, he's still holding on to this little bit of hope that maybe he's going to retain his sanity and come back to himself eventually. But obviously he doesn't, right? That boa thing is like a, it's like a, a feather scarf. It's like a feathery plush scarf that you might drape over your shoulders. It's a fashion item. And it kind of, you know, he, he gives you some descriptions like one of the um, that big burly maid. She also wears like an ostrich feather on her hat. He describes that, too, and describes it kind of blowing in the wind. That's interesting because they're these people are already kind of metamorphosized halfway. One's wearing furs. The other's wearing an ostrich feather. And they're both women. But we're not doing the Freudian reading. <laughs> no, there, there's definitely something you could pick up on in terms of Gregor and his relationship with his sister as well, because like that seems to be like the most human connection he has also. Like his sister's the only one who tries at least initially to kind of, you know, understand Gregor at his new level. Like she brings him some food. She's trying to be sympathetic. But then as Eric pointed out, like that also leads to the greatest betrayal because she's the one who says like, you know what? I give up on this thing our Gregor is dead. We should move on and just start over. And so I, I think, yeah, the fact that I think she's the one trying to move the portrait also, like there might be something going on there in terms of Gregor, his humanity, whatever. And and the yeah, sister she calls him out on his sort of selfish entitlement, right? Cause he's still in this mindset where I've done so much for this family. This is the least they could do for me. And he's getting angry and he's hissing at them and, and he's, he's, she calls him out on it. She says, you know, he wouldn't he wouldn't be putting us through this if he was truly thinking about us. He was only thinking about himself. And he never kind of realized that. He, his own sense of self-realization and gratitude was actually predicated on his family depending on him and becoming enfeebled in that way. And then this is kind of a poetic justice where he's actually the one who becomes dependent on them and becomes more and more feeble and bestial to the point where, you know, 
they drive <laughs> he drives them completely nuts and father throws apples at him sister gives up he he crawls out in the room to try and listen to this violin music and he has this at one point he just has this complete deranged fantasy where he's like i'm gonna bring my sister into my room and never let her leave and she's gonna play violin for me forever and we're gonna live happily ever after and you're just like oh no he's he's lost his mind now he's completely sunk into this fantasy of just him being the center of their world and it calls they call him out on that right interesting it's, it's cool interesting. that way so you have no patience you want to know the, yeah the deleuze and guitari reading of this exact scene is he wants to reinscribe the oedipal triangle that he lost by becoming a bug so to reinscribe the oedipal triangle he tries to attach himself to this picture as the mommy side of the triangle her his sister when she chastises him there, it's actually out of jealousy because he wants the picture more than he wants her. So that's why she turns on him, actually, because he wants the picture more than he wants her. Because he's he's desperate to, to, you know, he's a military boy. He he was like very faithful to his job. He's trying to reinscribe his place in the mommy, daddy, me complex. And that's why his sister, who's also competing for that spot, rejects him. Yeah. And Eric, it sounds like you're really uh, taking the family's view viewpoint on this, which is quite interesting. Because, yeah, I mean, we you can look at it from that point of view where like all his life, Gregor has been used to kind of, you know, like being the center of attention that way. And now his sister's kind of overtaking him in that dynamic. And it, it leads to this sort of like crisis for him. But it's 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 cool that you mentioned the violin because that's actually something we haven't touched on because the yeah his sister's music, especially towards the end of the story, seems to be kind of like what brings out some of the last shreds of Gregor's humanity before he finally dies. And there's actually I think a, there's a quote there's a line where he says uh, he specifically kind of like asks himself like quote was he an animal that music could move him so. He felt as if the way to the unknown nourishment he longed for were coming to light, end quote. So like, he's, he's, all, he's like, the question is raised of like, how much of an animal has this person become? How much should, should we be dehumanizing him? And how much might there be a way for redemption here? And it's, it's, it's cool that it's actually his sister's music that might be like something that could help him here. But it's his sister also who like in the end, like cuts him off and says, no, I'm, I'm I'm done with this like this this creature. So you're Litvik, so I assume you'll be able to answer this question easily off the cuff. But this music calms the savage beast thing. I'm sure that has hundreds of illusions in literature. Is this referencing any that you can think of? Nothing in particular. But what's what's really cool is that, or quite disturbing in in some ways here, this question of dehumanization is like is almost anticipating something that of course Kafka would have no way of knowing but the the dehumanization of his of of Gregor and more specifically of of course of like certain ethnic groups later on in the 20th century is something that becomes quite like foregrounded here around the music because his family is just they've they've given up on thinking of Gregor as a human right and even in this moment where his sister's playing music and Gregor actually comes towards the family in their living room and he wants to be part of this moment, that's when they like shoo him away. They're like, we're done with you. We do not regard you as one of us. And that's when the question is raised by Gregor himself. Am I an animal now? Then why am I still being like moved by this music? And for me, at least, like what, what, what that points to is like, especially this early in the 20th century is like the extent to which, you know, there's a there's going to be a lot of sort of references to dehumanization and stuff like that further on in literature and propaganda in Central Europe in the next decades to the extent where like questions of humanity and dehumanization around these things only become more and more kind of like prevalent that way. So I think that's a really significant moment in those terms where like the question of humanity in relation to culture is just like raised yeah, so starkly. So, it's there. so fun. Well, I think, sorry, <clears throat> I, I had to look it up, but I think the, the main reference is the Lear of Orpheus, because he calms uh he calms wild animals with the, sleep. Yeah. with the Lear. 
Oh, for sure. Yeah. And that would, again, be a callback to the classical metamorphosis tradition, right, with Ovid and things like that. So there is something to be said there, again, for like the, these these older motifs that Kafka is drawing on to tell a very kind of like secular fairy tale, almost this this parable in some ways, even though we're not allegorizing it, of course, but all the invitations are there to kind of think of this in those It's funny because he's yeah. really like brutish and entitled three dudes that they rent a room out to come out and they hear like his sister practicing like she's not even very good that's that's the thing right they go oh is that music is that music can we hear some and and the father is of course like yep yep okay uh, Greta come out and play for for them and they sit there start listening realize she's not very good so they start kind of like blowing smoke at her and getting really impatient and the door is open a crack, so Gregor is watching all this unfold, going, these people don't respect my sister. Her music is the best, right? So, But you're reading this scene, and it's just so sad. Like, the sister's playing this music. These people hate it, but they're just out of sheer courtesy. They're not saying anything. And they're having this this really, again, this sort of perverse performance where nobody's liking it. And then Gregor just kind of, goes into this immediate fantasy like i'm gonna steal her away and keep her in my room with me and it's it's odd well does he go that far does he just want to like fund her music at the conservatory because i think he's sort of like he's yearning to be the breadwinner again right that that's kind of what the music also brings out in him he's like i can help her but i need to like reconnect more with this music but then it they that's don't what get i that thought here he's like you know He's right after that quote you mentioned, he says, despite his transformed state, he said he was resolved to push his way right up to his sister and tug at his skirt as an indication to come into his room with her violin. He intended never to let her out of his room again, at least not as long as he lived. His horrifying shape was to be beneficial to him for the first time. He would be on guard at the doors of his room at once and spit at his assailants like a cat. But his sister would remain with him, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. She was to sit next to him on this couch and incline her ear towards him. Like he goes on and on in this just this fever dream right near the end. Where yeah, he so. the dream in which he's violating the taboo of incest. You could take it there for sure, but then well, it's punctured because then the actually the 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 rumors, the rentiers, they the renters notice him and go, Mr. Sansa, and they point at him, and then the music stops, and his sister kind of just goes into this trance. She's like so depressed, I guess, uh, uh, by this whole experience, and they then the then the room renters threaten to leave because they're like this disgusting, you know beast that's been right next to us this whole time and the family's been keeping this dirty little secret this whole time because they know he's been in there yet they've been trying to like squeeze a few extra bucks out of the apartment by renting some of the space yeah the house the house gross. value instantly plummets once they realize there's like a man-sized cockroach living in there <laughs> but <laughs> a yeah giant vermin bug Maybe yeah. So that 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 uh, passage you read, Eric, that that does kind of like evoke a Beauty and the Beast scenario, where like you know, he's the sister would be trapped with Gregor, and she would slowly heal him with her music. Yeah, it's maybe maybe there is an ancestral taboo here, which which has also been crossed. But uh, lots to think about. Yeah. Well, look, I'm just I'm throwing things out, but the I guess the in the end you can't read this as a Christology, you can't read it as just a Freudian uh, taboo. Every Because every time you you like commit to one reading, you can't read it as like, oh, the guy's depressed. Anytime you commit to one reading, there's just very distinct pr- plot elements that kind of pull that meaning apart. And yeah, like, or, like the capitalist reading you might want to go for too, right? Yeah, bureaucracy, the alienation, capitalism, the bureaucracy. Work. It starts with that. But it's never brought up again, really. Um, his death heals his family in a weird way. That, like, what does that mean? What did he do wrong? We don't know. So it resists uh, being read a certain way. But there is so much like literary references in here throughout that I don't know. That's probably intentional. I'm not good enough with literature to know. 
you know, <laughs> but it's 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 what makes it so rewarding, too, because like it, it doesn't sort of like tie itself up. We have to actively kind of like work as readers to sort of figure out how this is meaningful or like useful for us. Right. And I think like all these elements are there, like we're not reaching too far when we talk about, you know, the biblical or kind of like Jewish traditions in here or, of course, like the capitalist sort of socialist implications of Gregor's status here. Ultimately, though, like what what seems to come across is that the sadness of the family's abandonment of their son and brother like that, that is something that like is kind of inescapable at, at the plot level. Like there's something kind of like deeply upsetting about the way that like they he, the more Gregor becomes comfortable in his new form, the less the family kind of like recognizes him as their relative. And perhaps like that, that's sort of like the final commentary on like even the question of interpretation here is like whatever else we might think of this story, like clearly the, the family has failed to interpret Gregor properly. Like whatever they've done, like they are they have misread the situation. They don't know what to do with him. They think he's a burden. And Gregor, again, is not like disgusted by his form. He just he needs some sympathy and understanding and they do not provide that for him. So whatever we are supposed to do with this story, like clearly the family kind of is a warning of what maybe we shouldn't be doing. So that's. Yeah. And the one thing that we did not bring up that I would like to bring up that was my favorite part. It's not the plot elements and it's not the symbolism, but just the, even in translation, like I would love to be able to read German to get the sense of it, but these punctuated sentences with vivid descriptions. Like I said, I find the absurdity of some of the descriptions kind of funny, but it's short sentences, feels a little bit claustrophobic. There's very, uh, 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 I want to describe it as a compressed sense of time, um, like an urgency that's felt throughout that never is actually, you don't know what you're being urgent about, but it feels compressed claustrophobic anyway i'm describing my affective sense of the story because uh i that's really the thing that kept me going was like i can i how fast can i read this but then eventually sitting there and reading it this i i fell into the pace of it which i really appreciated a lot and you can't get that if we are doing your homework for you with this episode you can't get that from hearing a summary. You got yeah, it's really it. got that sort of James Joycey kind of element of of a of um, a moment in time being really really dragged out across many many pages, and it does jump around in time. But the the barrage of details and the kind of painful <laughs> extensions of of what's happening just through sheer description is is. Uh, is definitely, you know, this is the time of modernist literature, right? They're experimenting with form. They're trying to push the envelope of what you can do with the short story form, which which is not that, I, as far as I know, it's not that old at this point, the short story form. The 19th century, maybe this is when short stories really became, you know, solidified as a, as a, uh, as a respectable kind of literary vehicle. And now... In this early 20th century, you have, you know, Ezra Pound, make it new. And and Kafka's certainly doing something here with that. Well, most yeah, of the with, shit that with, I read these days is like you, you read the novel that is just meant to be turned into a movie. Like Game of Thrones is the best example. <laughs> the, the internal thoughts are like not all that interesting. It's heavily plot based. I was thinking this whole time, this could only be probably a short story. It couldn't it couldn't even be longer than this and you couldn't adapt it to a visual presentation cuz so much of it is dependent on his observations of of things around him, his own thoughts, his family's thoughts, his family's actions. Like it would be the it would be a terrible film and it could only be in this form, which is I I was it was refreshing cuz I don't really read literature as much as I would like. No, but that's a great point. And yeah, th this is not a homework read at all. Like it's a really fun story, e even in like the tone, as, as you were noting, Pills, it's so understated in comparison with what's actually happening. Like there, it, it's so minimal in the way that it just describes this stuff almost matter of factly. But just uh, two quick things to note as well is that, yeah, Kafka didn't even want like an image on the cover of like whatever creature 
Gregor has transformed into. He deliberately, I think, wants that ambiguity there for like, you know, you fill in the blank as a reader what we're dealing with here. So yeah, I, I think that this works especially well as a text and it would be it would be tricky to adapt this for the screen for sure. But the other thing we haven't touched on is actually like the um, the perspective that the story is being told from, right? Because we've been talking about it and it's not actually from Gregor's point of view, which is interesting. It's it's kind of third person, but like third person limited. So we kind of, we follow him around and we see a little bit more than him, but not much more. We're, we're kind of with Gregor the whole time, except for after his death at, at the very end. So I think that that's, pretty deliberate because like we we obviously identify a little bit more strongly with him because of that but it's also nice because like i think if it were first person it would lose something it would it would, it would be too easy to just dismiss this and say okay this is just a guy going crazy or having a bad dream right but because we are outside of gregor it's like again it gets back to that like literal nature of the story it's like no this is really happening like this is not a dream this is not a metaphor this is real in a way that like we can see a little bit more objectively from the from our perspective yeah, as like and the fact that person. we get about 10 more paragraphs after the death of gregor is is indicative of the the narrative perspective completely just at that point breaks away you think it's all from gregor's perspective but it's not because the narration continues but the perspective is dead <laughs> and then it just kind of describes the, that's after that that's the denouement it's it's done they're describing the end of it where the 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 maid comes in pokes him with a stick and go and then calls the, and and she's really irreverent she's like oh it's croaked it's it's it kicked the bucket you know and the family's like what what are you talking about and they go oh he's dead oh and then and then there's just this lift there's just this this relief this burden is completely removed and you get eight or to 10 more paragraphs of just like how the family then just emerges from the shell of this horrible nightmare and go becomes, I don't know, normal again, as normal as post COVID's going to be. Can I just read it? It's like, it's almost, it's almost sardonic how happy they are. They emerge into the sunshine, which yeah. has to be, there has to, let's get, let's finish with this analysis. So, yeah. Most of the last paragraph I'll just read here. After that, the three of them, the family uh, minus Gregor, left the flat together, which was something they had not done for months, and took the tram out to the open country outside of town. They had the tram filled with warm sunshine all to themselves. Leaned back comfortably on their seats, they discussed the prospects and found that on closer examination, they were not at all bad until... Then they had never asked each other about their work, but all three had jobs, which were very good and held quite a particularly good promise for the future. The greatest improvement for the time being, of course, would be achieved quite easily by moving house. What they needed now was a flat that was smaller and cheaper than the current one that had been chosen by Gregor, one that was in a better location and most of all more practical. All the time, Greta was becoming livelier, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost absurdly the nightmare's over. happy. Yeah, and they actually specifically end by like noting just how good looking a young woman Greta is becoming, and like she stretches her arms out, and that's the final line. It's it's kind of like again going back to this idea of there being like a metamorphosis for her as well that she's become of eligible marrying age. It's They've completely shifted their focus from Gregor to the daughter now. So, it, yeah, the tone is like really at odds with the tragedy, alleged tragedy, you know, that has ensued. There, there's no lament for Gregor. There's no real sense of like a loss in the family. And yeah, I mean, it, 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 it goes back again to this idea of like, how are we supposed to sort of process this whole story? It's like whatever we're doing, we kind of know like the family's the family has not done a good job of dealing with this difficult truth. They've they've repressed or dismissed something in a way that like they probably shouldn't have. And the awkwardness of Gregor's existence, like it, we, we're not necessarily meant to come up with a final interpretation of that. Because again, as we've seen, that's a fool's errand, but we shouldn't completely dismiss what happened either in the way that the family yeah, seems and Greta's to be sort of emergence blossoming is deeply contrasted 
this is just Kafka's like genius for creating these like whiplash contrasts is just like indeed Gregor's body was completely flat and dry actually that could be seen only now when he was no longer lifted up on his little legs and nothing else diverted their attention so he's just been fading away and they really didn't notice it but that comes out at the end and just makes this huge point of contrast with then Greta's sort of then they then they notice her and, and she's she's bloomed right so. I, I know we're at time i want to stay on this point for a second this just brought back the memory of another one of his texts um the hunger artist so the basic plot and sorry again spoiler if you guys haven't read it but the plot of the, the hunger artist is there's a guy who starves himself for other people's entertainment in like on a stage in the middle of town or in a cage i think actually it is he starves himself and people come by and they observe him starving himself Eventually, he withers away and dies, and no one cares because everyone has lost interest in the art of starving yourself. And immediately at the end of the at the end of the story, final paragraph, they replace him with a tiger, and everybody is so interested in the tiger. They all come watch the tiger. It's full of life, lively, and that replacement is happening right here as well. And as I've said several times throughout this, I'm not good at the at the interpretive, but I wanted to know, like, if it happens twice, it's definitely intentional. One person withers away painfully, excruciatingly slowly, and then something full of life, sexual, sensual, energetic takes its yeah, place. Yeah, that, that definitely lines up with, you know, the descriptions of the darkness in the room that Gregor is hiding in and the light that the family emerges into at the end, like... If you want like a visual metaphor for that, that's chiaroscuro, right? Heavy light and heavy shadow all in the same frame. And that's what he's doing there. He's he's doing this kind of chiaroscuro black and like it's described as a story in black and white. I think that's Nabokov uses that. And it really you get that. But then you can go further with that with verbal literature, right? Because you can then then hang on all these other things as well. All these other contrasts can come forth. Yeah, and in, in, in some way, again, like the, the contrast between Gregor's transformation and his sister's at the end, is it, it, it does sort of like draw attention to itself. And especially in the way that the family seems to have somehow stifled the son's transformation, but they're, they're really happy about the daughter's changes. And again, going back to the father, like pelting apples at the son and it's those apples which ultimately like lead to the wound that kills Gregor. It's a lot of this comes down to the way that the family reacted to this unusual situation and the extent to which they weren't able to kind of, you know, properly interpret their, their son's uh, changes. Yeah. It's also, I mean, this is like my best attempt at an interpretation, but in this story and the other story that I was referencing, this the person that's hanging around is kind of their 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 suffering is a little bit self-inflicted and kind of absurd like it's not really anybody's fault um but they 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 continue until they die then it's a relief to everybody and then we can you know move on with our lives and kind of replace it which i guess points to a bit of just suffering's absurd you you try to put meaning on it but Ultimately, it matters to you. No one else is expected to care, and they're probably annoyed that you have to go through this anyway. Yeah, and it also kind of speaks to the commercial or transactional nature of a lot of these relationships, right? And yeah. even maybe like the transactional nature or the sort of the fleeting nature of this story in itself, like the act of storytelling is over, the novelty is gone. All right, we're just going to dispose of this now and move on to the next shiny thing. But should we be doing that? I mean, there, there, there's different ways in which this sort of theme of like, you know, replacing what is withered with something new and fresh is, is kind of uh, clearly being played with here by Kafka. Yeah. So they, you and said at the beginning, they don't have happy endings, but technically they do. It's just slammed into like four lines at the very end. Well, you know, if you're like Eric and you're with team uh, <laughs> patriarchal father, then of course it's a, it's, it, it's a happy ending, but Gregor isn't doing so well. No, just one, one last little note on the, I, I on, on the German term, actually, for Gregor's uh, insecthood here, because I think this might help us sort of put a bow on some of this, at least. Uh, 
So we talked about how he's called a monstrous like insect or vermin in English, but apparently in German, the term is it's an older term that Kafka uses. I'm gonna try to pronounce it. It's a unguhers ungezeifer, which has implications of of something which is no longer suitable for sacrifice. So like something old and disgusting and like no longer like acceptable in a certain way. Mm. Is the no longer part of the word? Because like a fallen, uh, a fallen thing. Yeah, maybe Eric would do a better job on the German than me. But the the older implications of that term, at least in an archaic sense, seem to be something which is no longer like acceptable as a sacrificial offering as yeah. well. Yeah, that's. I mean, the the term itself. Yeah, that's that's better than I could do with the meaning of it. Yeah, ungeziefer. It kind of just means yeah and it I mean bug vermin but then it has all those those older implications Fil yeah filthy and un unclean in a way that in jewish traditions especially refers to like you know like ritual cleansing and sacrifice as well yeah could you call it like a pest in english because we refer to pests as yeah my translation's enormous bug <laughs> unwanted it could be insect could be rodent could be weeds. Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't capture all the kind of sort thing. of yeah. meaning you're missing in the German. There's again, as 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 Eric brought up, like the sense of the grotesque and the disgusting is really important here. There's just there's like a primal reaction to like wanting to get rid of this thing, whatever it is, at least for the family. And then as readers, we're kind of like, you know, we are left to decide how much we agree with yeah. them. Yeah. It's fallen, it's unclean. The nightmare is over, but there's a odd taste in your mouth at the end. <laughs> No matter how happy that ending is, kind that's of, not gonna that's not gonna erase. Yeah. Well, if if this was a movie adaptation, you can just see like Greta's has a baby or something, and like all of a sudden the baby's legs start twitching and like and the transformation yeah. begins again. Yeah, question mark. Yeah. Well, listener, and you guys, uh the nightmare of this <laughs> podcast is over and we can it's it's pretty sunny here. Blue sky. We can, oh, yeah. It's a beautiful fall day. It's yeah. a little late, but it's fucking cold. Anyway, we don't need to go into that. Uh, thank you so much again, Victor Litvik, for showing up. Do you want to? Do you want to shout out to anything? Do you want people to follow you on anything? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter as well. Uh, you can probably put the link in the video description. But yeah, other than that, um, definitely check out this story, even if uh, we've kind of unpacked it for you a little bit. Because again, it's not a homework read. It's a lot of fun, and there's really regardless of all that we've kind of like talked about there's no final say on it like the whole point is that everyone's going to get something like interesting and unique out of this kind of a story so it's yeah. a trip either way and people are pe people are still reading it like it's got uh for good reason yeah it it, it does speak to something that is clearly still relevant Die Verfondlung. i'm sure it's read in it's sure it's read in in queer theory disability studies all that kind of thing anyway uh, thank you, listeners. This has been uh, something like 94. I hope that's right. 94 feels like a, a little bit of a Kafkaesque number. It's not quite anywhere, but it's almost, almost somewhere. Triple digits. Here we come. So, so with that said, you've escaped the maze, and uh, you can ascend into the warm light of day as long as you have a brother to second. Yeah, I'm going to go have an apple. It made me hungry. All right. Goodbye. Ciao. Bye.